Good evening. Tonight starts something new, as Charles Kuralt would say, on the very first edition of the CBS Sunday Morning Program back in 1979. Well, I'm your host, Jason DiCanio, and as you know, you know me from the Queen's New Yorker channel that right now has over 114 episodes and is doing well. Tonight we start a new series on the same channel, a series dedicated basically to the people, the legacy people of Queens, and what they've done for us over the past century, let alone anything else in that matter as well. Tonight, we look at the man who pretty much made the roads, the bridges, the tunnels, the highways of our lives through Queens and through the five boroughs. Who am I talking about? Robert Moses. And now, let us begin our show of the legacy of Queens with a salute to a new beginning. Thank you very much. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the show. Oh, you're too kind. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> oh. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Well, this is a Friday show, as they say, and we're going to make it like it was on a Friday, July 10, 2020, the first episode of The Legacy of Queens tonight, celebrating, of course, Robert Moses' triumphant uh, road to success, basically, in his uh, new way, shape, and form, and where he's going and what he's been doing. So we're going to look at his great life and uh, talk to you a little bit about what he accomplished over his 92 years in New York City. He was born on December 18th, 1888, and he died on July 29th, 1981. And he was an American public official who worked mainly in the New York metropolitan area, known as the master builder of the mid-20th century, New York City, Long Island, Rockland County, and Westchester County. And he is sometimes compared to Baron Haussmann of Second Empire Paris, who was one of the most polarizing figures in the history of urban development in the United States. His decisions favoring highways over public transit helped create the modern suburbs of Long Island and influenced the generation of engineers, architects, and urban planners who spread his philosophies across the nation, despite his not having been trained in those professions. Moses would call himself a coordinator, and was referred to in the media as a master builder. Robert Moses at one point held 12 titles simultaneously, including New York City Parks Commissioner and Chairman of the Long Island State Parks Commission, but was never elected to any public office. He ran only once for governor of New York as a Republican in 1934 and lost to Herbert H. Lehman in a landslide. Nevertheless, he created and led numerous public authorities that gave him autonomy for the general public or from the general public and elected officials. Through these authorities, he controlled millions of dollars in income from his projects, such as tolls, and he could issue bonds to borrow vast sums for new ventures with little or no input from legislative bodies. This removed him from the power of the purse, as it is normally functioned in the United States, and from the process of public comment on major public works. And as a result of Moses' work, New York has the United States' greatest proportion of public benefit corporations, which are the prime mode of infrastructure, building, and maintenance in New York, and account for most of the state's debt. 
All, of course, our information comes from the Wikipedia, pictures by the Wikimedia. Now, Moses' projects were considered by many to be necessary for the region's development after the Great Depression. And during the height of his powers, New York City built campuses to host two World Fair, one in 1939 and the other one in 1964. Moses also helped persuade the United Nations to locate its headquarters in Manhattan instead of in Philadelphia by helping the state secure the money and land needed for the project. His reputation for efficiency and nonpartisan leadership was permanently damaged by Robert Carroll's Pulitzer-winning biography, The Power Broker, which accused Moses of a lust for power, questionable ethics, vindictiveness, and racism. Moses was born in New Haven, Connecticut, to assimilated Jew German Jewish parents, Bell Silverman and Emmanuel Moses. And he spent the first nine years of his life at 83 Dwight Street in New Haven, two blocks from Yale University. In 1897, the Moses family moved to New York City, where they lived on East 46th Street off of Fifth Avenue. Moses' father was a successful department store owner and real estate speculator in New Haven. In order for the family to move to New York City, he sold his real estate holdings and store and retired from business for the rest of his life. Moses' mother was an active in the settlement movement with her own love of building, and Robert Moses and his brother Paul attended several schools for their elementary and secondary education, including the Dwight School and the Mohegan Lake School, which was a military academy near Peekskill. Now, after graduating from Yale College with a bachelor's in 1909 and Wyndham College, Oxford, and a BA in jurisprudence, 1911, with a master's degree in 1913 and earning a Ph.D. in political science from Columbia University, Moses became attracted to New York City reform politics. Common, committed idealist, he developed several plans to rid New York of patronage hiring practices, including being the leader of a 1919 proposal to reorganize the New York state government. None went very far, but Moses, due to his intelligence, caught the notice of Bell Moskowitz, a friend and trusted advisor to Governor Al Smith. And when the state secretary of state's position became appointive rather than elective, Smith named Moses. Moses served from 1927 to 1929. Moses rose to power with Smith, who was elected as governor in 1922, and set in motion a sweeping consolidation of the New York state government. During that period, Moses began his first foray into large-scale public work initiatives while driving on drawing on Smith's political power to enact legislation. This helped create the new Long Island State Park Commission and the State Council of Parks. And in 1924, Governor Alfred E. Smith appointed Moses chairman of the State Council of Parks and president of the Long Island State Parks Commission. This centralization allowed Smith to run a government later used as a model for Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal federal government. Moses also received numerous commissions that he carried out extraordinarily well, such as the development of Jones's Beach State Park, displaying a strong command of law as well as matters of engineering. Moses became known for his skill in drafting legislation and was called the best bill drafter in Albany. And at a time when the public was accustomed to Tammany Hall corruption and incompetence, Moses was seen as a savior of government. Shortly after President Franklin D. Roosevelt's inauguration in 1933, the federal government found itself with millions of New Deal dollars to spend. Yet states and cities had few projects already. Moses was one of the few local officials who had projects shovel-ready. For that reason, New York City was able to obtain significant works, progress, administration, those were WPAs, Civilian Conservation Corps, Triple C, and other Depression-era funding. Moses was a great political talent who demonstrated great skill when constructing his roads, bridges, playgrounds, parks, and housing projects. One of his most influential and long-lasting positions was that of Parks Commissioner of New York City, a role he served from January 18, 1934, to May 23, 1960. And as I mentioned before at the top, he did hold 12 titles, 
Long Island State Park Commission, the New York State Council of Parks, New York Secretary of State, the Beth Page State Park Authority, Emergency Public Works Commission, Jones Beach Park Author Parkway Authority, New York City Department of Parks, the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, New York City Planning Commission, the New York State Power Authority, New York's World Fair, and Office of the Governor of New York, which he was a special advisor on housing. During the 1920s, Moses sparred with President Roosevelt, then head of the Taconic State Park Commission, who favored the prompt construction of a parkway through the Hudson Valley. Moses succeeded in diverting funds to his Long Island Parkway projects, which was the Northern State Parkway, the Southern State, and the Wontaw State Parkway. And although the Tonic Taconic State Parkway was later completed as well, Moses helped build Long Island's Meadowbrook State Parkway. It was the first fully divided, limited access highway in the world. However, in the power broker, biographer Robert Caro writes that Moses deliberately designed the parkways to have low bridges to prevent low-income families from traveling by bus to destinations outside of New York. Moses was a highly influential figure in the initiation of many of the reforms that restructured New York State's government during the 1920s. A Reconstruction Commission, headed by Moses, produced a highly influential report that provided recommendations that would largely be adopted, including the consolidation of 187 existing agencies under 18 departments, a new executive budget system, and the four-year term limit for the governorship. Now, during the Depression, Moses, along with Mayor Fiorello H. LaGuardia, was responsible for the construction of 10 gigantic swimming pools under the WPA program. Combined, they could accommodate for 66,000 swimmers. And one such pool is McCarran Park Pool in Brooklyn, which was dry for decades and used only for special cultural events, but later reopened to the public. Moses allegedly fought to keep African-American swimmers out of his pools and beaches. One subordinate remembers Moses saying the pool should be kept a few degrees colder allegedly because Moses believed African-Americans did not like cold water. And although Moses had the power over the construction of all New York City Housing Authority, public housing projects, and headed many other entities, it was his chairmanship of the Triborough Bridge Authority that gave him the most power. The Triborough Bridge later officially renamed the Robert F. Kennedy Bridge, opened in 1936, connecting the Bronx, Manhattan, and Queens via three separate spans. Language in its authorities, bonds, contracts, and multi-year commissioner appointments made it largely impervious to pressure from mayors and governors. And while New York City and New York State were perpetually strapped for money, the bridge's toll revenues amounted to tens of millions of dollars a year. The authority was thus able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars by selling bonds, a method also used by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey to fund large public construction projects. Toll revenues rose quickly as traffic on the bridges exceeded all projections. Rather than pay off the bonds, Moses used the revenue to build other toll projects, a cycle that would feed on itself. In the late 1930s, a municipal controversy raged over whether an additional vehicle link between Brooklyn and Lower Manhattan should be built as a bridge or a tunnel. Bridges can be wider and cheaper to build, but taller and longer bridges use more ramp space at landfill than tunnels do. A Brooklyn battery bridge would have decimated Battery Park and physically encroached on the financial district. And for this reason, the bridge was opposed by the Regional Plan Association historical preservationists, Wall Street financial interests, property owners, various high society people, construction unions, and the Manhattan Borough President, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, and Governor H. Herbert, Herbert H. Lehman. Now, despite this, Moses favored a bridge which could both carry more automobile tra traffic and serve as a higher visibility monument than a tunnel. LaGuardia and Lehman, as usual, had little money to spend in part 
due to the Great Depression, while the federal government was running low on funds after receiving $105 million or $1.8 billion in 2016 on the Queen's Midtown Tunnel and other city projects and refused to provide any additional funds to New York. A wash in funds from Triborough Bridge tolls, Moses deemed that money could only be spent on a bridge. He also clashed with chief engineer of the project, Ole Singstad, who preferred a tunnel instead of a bridge. Only a lack of key federal approval thwarted the bridge project, and President Roosevelt ordered the War Department to assort or to assert that bombing a bridge in that location would block East River access to the Brooklyn Navy Yard upstream. Thwarted, Moses dismantled the New York State or the New York Aquarium on Castle Clinton and moved it to Coney Island in Brooklyn, where it grew much bigger. This was an apparent retaliation based on suspicious, suspicious claims that the proposed tunnel would undermine Castle Clinton's foundation. He also attempted to raise Castle Clinton itself, the historic fort, surviving only after being transferred to the federal government. Moses now had no other option for a Trans River crossing than to build a tunnel. He commissioned the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, which was now officially the Hugh L. Carey Tunnel, a tunnel connecting Brooklyn to Lower Manhattan. A 1941 publication from the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority claimed that the government had forced them to build a tunnel at twice the cost, twice the operating fees, twice the difficulty to engineer, and half the traffic. And although engineering studies did not support these conclusions, and a tunnel may have held many of the advantages Moses publicly tried to attach to the bridge option. And this had not been the first time Moses pressed for a bridge over a tunnel. He had tried to upstage the tunnel authority when the Queen's Midtown Tunnel was being planned. He had raised the same arguments, which failed due to their lack of political support. Moses' power increased after World War II after Mayor LaGuardia retired and a series of successors consented to almost all of his proposals. Named City Construction Coordinator in 1946 by Mayor William O'Dwyer, Moses became New York City's de facto representative in Washington, and he was also given powers over public housing that had looted him under LaGuardia. When O'Dwyer was forced to resign in disgrace and was succeeded by Vincent R. Impelateri, Moses was able to assume even greater behind-the-scenes control of over-infrastructure projects. One of Moses' first steps after Impelitary took office was halting the creation of a citywide comprehensive zoning plan underway since 1938 that would have curtailed his nearly unlimited power to build within the city and remove the zoning commission from power in the process. Moses was also empowered as the sole authority to negotiate in Washington for New York City projects. By 1959, he had overseen construction of 28,000 apartment units on hundreds of acres of land. In clearing the land for high rises in accordance with the towers in the park concept, which at that time was seen as innovative and beneficial by leaving more grassy areas between high rises, Moses sometimes destroyed almost as many housing units as he built. From the 30s to the 60s, Robert Moses was responsible for the construction of the Triborough, Marine Parkway, Throgsneck, Bronx, Whitestone, Henry Hudson, and Verrazano Narrows Bridges. His other projects included the Brooklyn Queens Expressway and Staten Island Expressway, which together constituted more of Interstate 278. The Cross Bronx Expressway, many New York State parkways, and other highways. Federal interest had shifted from parkway to freeway systems, and the new roads mostly conformed to the new vision, lacking the landscape or the commercial traffic restrictions of the pre-war highways. He was the mover behind Shea Stadium and Lincoln Center and contributed to the United Nations headquarters. Moses had influence outside the New York area as well. Public officials in many smaller American cities hired him to design freeway networks in the 1940s and early 50s. For example, Portland, Oregon hired Moses in 1943. His plan included a loop around the city center with spurs running through their neighborhoods. 
of this plan, only I-405, its links with I-5, and the Fremont Bridge were built. Moses knew how to drive an automobile, but he did not have a valid driver's license. Moses' highways in the first half of the 20th century were parkways, curving, landscaped, ribbon parks that were intended to be pleasures to travel as well as lungs for the city. Though the post-World War II economic expansion and notion of the automotive city brought freeways, most notably in the form of the vast federally funded interstate highway system network. Moses' reputation began to fade during the 1960s, and around this time, his political acumen began to fail him as he unwisely packed several controversial political battles he could not possibly win. For example, his campaign against the free Shakespeare in the Park program received much negative publicity, and his effort to destroy a shaded playground in Central Park to make way for a parking lot for the expensive tavern on the Green Restaurant earned him many enemies among the middle-class voters of the Upper West Side. The opposition reached a climax over the demolition of Pennsylvania Station, which many attributed to the development of scheme mentality cultivated by Moses, even though it was the impoverished Pennsylvania Railroad that was actually responsible for the demolition. This casual destruction of one of New York's greatest architectural landmarks helped prompt many city residents to turn against Moses' plans to build a lower Manhattan Expressway, which would have gone through Greenwich Village and what is now Soho. This plan and the Mid-Manhattan Expressway both failed politically, and one of his most vocal critics during this time was the urban activist Jane Jacobs, whose book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, was instrumental in turning opinion against Moses' plans. The city government rejected the expressway in 1964. Moses' power was further eroded by his association with the 90, 1964 New York World's Fair. His projections for attendance of 70 million people for this event proved widely optimistic, and generous contracts for fair executives and contractors made matters worse economically. He repeated in forceful public denials of the fair's considerable financial difficulties in the face of evidence to the contrary, eventually provoked press and governmental investigations, which found accounting irregularities. In his organization of the fair, his reputation was now undermined by the same personal character traits that had worked in his favor in the past. Disdain for the opinions of others and bodies supervising such events would be devastating to the success of the event. And the fact that the fair was not sanctioned by the Bureau of International Expositions, Moses refused to accept the BIE requirements, including a restriction agent or restriction against charging ground rents to exhibitors, and the BIE in turn instructed its members' nations not to participate. Well, during the last years of his life, Moses concentrated on his lifelong love of swimming, and he was an active member of the Colony Hill Health Club. He died on, of heart disease on July 29, 1981, at the age of 92 at Good Samaritan Hospital in West Islip, New York. Moses was of Jewish origin and raised in a secularist manner inspired by the ethical culture movement of the late 19th century, he was a convert to Christianity and was interred in a crypt in an outdoor community mausoleum in Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, New York City, following services at St. Peter's by the Sea Episcopal Church in Bayshore, New York. Various locations and roadways in New York State bear Moses' name. These include two state parks, Robert Moses State Park, Thousand Islands in Messina, and Robert Moses State Park, Long Island, the Robert Moses Causeway on Long Island, and the Robert Moses Hydroelectric Dam in Lewiston, New York. During his tenure as chief of the state park system, the state's inventory of parks grew to nearly 2,600,000 acres. By the time he left office, he had built 658 playgrounds in New York City alone, plus 416 miles of parkways and 13 bridges. However, 
The proportion of public benefit corporations is greater in New York than in any other U.S. state. Marking them, or making them, prime the prime mode of infrastructure building and maintenance in New York and accounting for 90% of the state's debt. And that is a look at Robert Moses, folks, on the legacy of Queens. We thank you so much for joining us tonight for this first great episode. Next week, we're going to be looking at the mayor who had played a big role, and they even named an airport after him. Who am I talking about? Fiorello LaGuardia, the man behind not only being the 99th mayor, but also for doing a lot as mayor, his legacy, and his life. All next week on The Legacy of Queens. Have a great weekend. We'll see you tomorrow for episode 115 of the Queens New Yorker. I leave you now with some soul searching. Good night, folks. Don't forget to subscribe to the Democratizing Network for great more content like this one.